Bobby Birds by John Harley Read for LibriVox.org by Jim I wandered out one summer's morn Across a meadow newly shorn Sun was shining bright and clear And fragrant scents rose up in air And all was still When as my steps were idly roving I come upon a sight so loving It filled me out with tender feeling As down I sank beside it kneeling or the edge, or the hill. It were a little skylark's nest, and two young babby birds undressed, were gaping with a beak so wide, calling for mammy to provide their morning's meal. And I upon the little home, the sand of daddy's warbling come, ringing so sweetly a me ear, like breathing through a pure sphere. He sang so well, the mammy a few yards away, were hopping on a bit of hay, to fear to come to bolt to flee, and watching me with troubled ease, she seemed to say, don't touch me bonny babs, young man, the daddy does the best he can, to cheer you with his sweetest song, and those'll sing as we lay along, so let em stay, that ain't thing I'd do em arm, come shelter em and keep em warm, for I've a little nest me sen, and two young babs I'm proud to tell, that's precious too, and they've a mammy watching there, a tow's them little ends a dear, and dearer still if that can be, now what these young uns are to thee, so come now do, ah well that shy thou ups away, thou dost trust a word I say, thou thinks I'm here to rob and plunder, ah confess I do not wonder, but there's no need, I'll leave thee to yourselves goodbye, but now I see your daddy's nigh. He's dropped that strain so sweet and strong. He loves you better nor his song. He does indeed. I walked away and saw me ear. Caught up the sand a warbling clear. Thinks ah, they're happy once again. I'm glad I didn't prove so mean. To rob that nest. For they're contented with a lot. Nor envied me with little cot. And in this world as we go through... "'Tisn't much good that we can do, and do our best. "'Then let us do as little wrong, to only as we pass along, "'and never seek a joy to gain, that's purchased with another's pain. "'Tisn't right, and shall go home we later at, "'to mend our Johnny's little cat. "'He always finds me work enough to piecing up his broken stuff for every neat. "'And Sally's eye, if you could see her, and I sit down to get me tear. She puts a dolly on me knee and makes me sing it hush a bee in the rocking chair. Then begs her sugar for it too. What it can't eat, she tries to do. And turning up a cunning knee, she rubs a dull mouth and says, You see, it gets its share. Sometimes I'm rather cross, I fear. Then starts a little trembling tear. And like a drop of glittering dew, swimming within a wild flower blue, falls from the tree. But as the sun in April shares, revives a little dropping flares, kind word brings the sweet smile back. I really think me brain'd crack if they to dee. Then if I love me bane so well, may knit a skylark's bosom veil. As me concern for little things, at snooze of the shelter of which her wings. So well affords, if folk what no but here but mind, how much is gained by being kind. There's fewer breasts with grief had swell, and fewer folk a thoughtless mel, even birds. End of recording. This recording is in the public domain. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Compensation by James Edwin Campbell Read for LibriVox.org by Fox and the Stars of ShiningHalf.com 
O rich young lord, thou ridest by with looks of high disdain. It chafes me not thy title high, thy blood of oldest strain. The lady riding at thy side is but in name thy promised bride. Ride on, young lord, ride on. Her father wills, and she obeys the custom of her class. Tis land, not love, the trothing sways, for land he sells his lass. Her fair white hand, young lord, is thine. Her soul, proud fool, her soul is mine. Ride on, young lord, ride on. No title high my father bore, the tenant of thy farm. He left me what I value more, clean heart, clear brain, strong arm. And love for bird and beast and bee, and song of lark and hymn of sea, Ride on, young lord, ride on. The boundless sky to me belongs, the paltry acre is thine. The painted beauty sings thy songs, the lavrock lilts me mine. The hot-housed orchid blooms for thee, the gorse and heather bloom for me. Ride on, young lord, ride on. Recorded May 1st, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. Conquered Hymn by Ralph Waldo Emerson Sung at the completion of the Battle Monument on July 4, 1837 Read for LibriVox.org by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina by the rude bridge that arched the flood, Their flag to April's breeze unfurled, Here once the embattled farmers stood And fired the shot heard round the world. The foe long since in silence slept, Alike the conqueror silent sleeps, And time the ruined bridge has swept Down the dark stream which seaward creeps. On this green bank, by this soft stream, We set to-day a votive stone, that memory may their deed redeem, When, like our sires, our sons are gone. Spirit that made those heroes dare To die and leave their children free, Bid time and nature gently spare The shaft we raise to them and thee. End of poem. The Day is Done by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Recorded for LibriVox.org by Robert Garrison The day is done, and the darkness falls from the wings of night, as a feather is wafted downward from an eagle in his flight. I see the lights of the village gleam through the rain and the mist, and a feeling of sadness comes o'er me that my soul cannot resist. A feeling of sadness and longing that is not akin to pain, and resembles sorrow only as the mist resembles the rain. Come, read to me some poem, some simple and heartfelt lay that shall soothe this restless feeling and banish the thoughts of day. Not from the grand old masters, not from the bard sublime, whose distant footsteps echo through the corridors of time. For, like strains of martial music, their mighty thoughts suggest life's endless toil and endeavor, and tonight I long for rest. Read from some humbler poet, whose songs gushed from his heart, as showers from the clouds of summer, or tears from the eyelids start, who, through long days of labor, and nights devoid of ease, still heard in his soul the music of wonderful melodies. Such songs have power to quiet the restless pulse of care, and come like the benediction that follows after prayer. Then read from the treasured volume the poem of thy choice, and lend to the rhyme of the poet 
the beauty of thy voice. And the night shall be filled with music, and the cares that infest the day shall fold their tents like the Arabs, and as silently steal away. End of poem. Exile by Winifred Wells. Read for LibriVox.org by Nicole Doolin. On the web at NicoleDoolin.com. I have made grief a gorgeous, queenly thing, and worn my melancholy with an air. My tears were big as stars to deck my hair. My silence stunning as a sapphire ring, oh, more than any light the dark could fling, a glamour over me to make me rare, better than any color I could wear, the pearly grandeur that the shadows bring. What is there left to joy for such as I? What throne can dawn upraise for me, who found the dusk so royal and so rich a one? Laughter will whirl and whistle on the sky. Far from this riot I shall stand uncrowned, disrobed, bereft, an outcast in the sun. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Feet of Judas by George Marion McClellan Read for LibriVox.org by Fox and the Stars of ShiningHalf.com Christ washed the feet of Judas, the dark and evil passions of his soul, his secret plot and sordidness complete, his hate, his purposing, Christ knew the whole, and still in love he stooped and washed his feet. Christ washed the feet of Judas, yet all his lurking sin was bare to him, his bargain with the priest, and more than this, in Olivet, beneath the moonlight dim, aforehand knew and felt his treacherous kiss. Christ washed the feet of Judas, and so ineffable his love, t'was meet that pity fill his great forgiving heart, and tenderly to wash the traitor's feet, who in his Lord had basely sold his part. Christ washed the feet of Judas, and thus a girded servant self-abased, taught that no wrong this side the gate of heaven was ever too great to wholly be effaced, and though unasked, in spirit be forgiven. And so if we have ever felt the wrong of trampled rights, of caste, it matters not. Whate'er the soul has felt or suffered long, O heart, this one thing should not be forgot. Christ washed the feet of Judas. Recorded May 2nd, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. The Garden of Proserpine by Algernon Charles Swinburne. Read for LibriVox.org by Larissa Migachev. Here where the world is quiet... Here, where all trouble seems, dead winds and spent waves riot in doubtful dreams of dreams, I watch the green field growing for reaping folk and sowing, for harvest time and mowing, a sleepy world of streams. I'm tired of tears and laughter and men that laugh and weep, of what may come hereafter for men that sow to reap. I'm weary of days and hours, blown buds of barren flowers, Desires and dreams and powers, and everything but sleep. Here life has death for neighbor, and far from eye or ear, Worn waves and wet winds labor, weak ships and spirits steer. They drive adrift and whither they wot not who make thither. But no such winds blow hither, and no such things grow here. No growth of moor or coppice, no heather flower or vine, But bloomless buds of poppies, Green grapes of proserpine, pale beds of blowing rushes, where no leaf blooms or blushes, save this whereout she crushes for dead men deadly wine. Pale without name or number, in fruitless fields of corn, they bow themselves in slumber all night till light is born. 
and like a soul belated in hell and heaven unmated, by cloud and mist abated, comes out of darkness morn. Though one were strong as seven, he too with death shall dwell, nor wake with wings in heaven, nor weep for pains in hell. Though one were fair as roses, his beauty clouds and closes, and well though love reposes, in the end it is not well. Pale beyond porch and portal, Crowned with calm leaves she stands, Who gathers all things mortal With cold, immortal hands. Her languid lips are sweeter Than loves who fears to greet her, To men that mix and meet her For many times and lands. She waits for each and other, She waits for all men born, Forgets the earth her mother, The life of fruits and corn. And spring and seed and swallow Take wing for her and follow Where summer song rings hollow and flowers are put to scorn. There go the loves that wither, the old loves with wearier wings, and all dead years draw thither, and all disastrous things, dead dreams of days forsaken, blind buds that snows have shaken, wild leaves that winds have taken, red strays of ruined springs. We are not sure of sorrow, and joy was never sure. Today will die tomorrow, Time stoops to no man's lure, And love grown faint and fretful, With lips but half regretful, Sighs and with eyes forgetful, Weeps that no loves endure. From too much love of living, From hope and fear set free, We thank with brief thanksgiving, Whatever gods may be, That no life lives forever, That dead men rise up never, That even the weariest river Winds somewhere safe to see. Then star nor sun shall waken, nor any change of light, nor sound of waters shaken, nor any sound or sight, nor wintry leaves, nor vernal, nor days, nor things diurnal, only the sleep eternal in an eternal night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Hangman at Home by Carl Sandburg Read for LibriVox.org by Fox and the Stars of ShiningHalf.com What does a hangman think about when he goes home at night from work, when he sits down with his wife and children for a cup of coffee and a plate of ham and eggs? Do they ask him if it was a good day's work, and everything went well, or do they stay off some topics and kill about the weather, baseball, politics, and the comic strips in the papers and the movies? Do they look at his hands when he reaches for the coffee or the ham and eggs? If the little ones say, Daddy, play horse, here's a rope, does he answer like a joke, I seen enough rope for today? Or does his face light up like a bonfire of joy, and does he say, It's a good and dandy world we live in? And if a white-faced moon looks in through a window, where a baby girl sleeps, and the moon gleams mix with baby ears and baby hair, the hangman, how does he act then? It must be easy for him. Anything is easy for a hangman, I guess. Recorded April 30th, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. Inversnade by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read for LibriVox.org by Chris the Girl. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. This darksome burn, horseback brown, his rollrock high road roaring down, in coop and in comb, the fleece of his foam flutes, and low to the lake falls home. A wind puff bonnet of fawn froth turns and twindles over the broth of a pool so pitch black, fell frowning, it rounds and rounds despair to drowning. Degged with dew, dappled with dew are the groins of the braise that the brook treads through, Wiry heath packs, flitches of fern, and the bee bonny ash that sits over the burn. What would the world be once bereft of wet and of wildness? Let them be left, ah, oh, let them be left, wildness and wet. Long live the weeds and the wilderness yet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Our Share of Night to Bear by Emily Dickinson Read for LibriVox.org by Fox in the Stars of ShiningHalf.com Our share of night to bear, our share of morning, 
Our blank in bliss to fill, Our blank in scorning. Here a star, and there a star, Some lose their way. Here a mist, and there a mist, Afterwards, day. Recorded May 23rd, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April, in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, If the British march, by land or sea, from the town to-night, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the north church tower as a signal light, one if by land, and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be, ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. Then he said, Good night, and with muffled oar, silently rode to the Charlestown shore, just as the moon rose over the bay, where swinging wide at her moorings lay the Somerset British man of war, a phantom ship with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge black hulk that was magnified by its own reflection in the tide. Meanwhile his friend through alley and street wanders and watches with eager ears, till in the silence around him he hears the muster of men at the barrack door, the sound of arms, and the tramp of feet, and the measured tread of the grenadiers marching down to their boats on the shore. Then he climbed the tower of the old north church by the wooden stairs with stealthy tread to the belfry chamber overhead, and startled the pigeons from their perch. On the sombre rafters that round him made masses and moving shapes of shade, by the trembling ladder steep and tall to the highest window in the wall, where he paused to listen and looked down a moment on the roofs of the town and the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath, in the churchyard, lay the dead, in their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in silence so deep and still, that he could hear, like a sentinel's tread, the watchful night wind as it went, creeping along from tent to tent, and seeming to whisper, All is well. A moment only he feels the spell of the place and the hour and the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead, for suddenly all his thoughts are bent on a shadowy something far away where the river widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred with a heavy stride, on the opposite shore walked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side, now he gazed at the landscape far and near, then impetuous stamped the earth and turned and tightened his saddle girth, but mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old north church, as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and sombre and still. And lo, as he looks on the belfry's height, a glimmer and then a gleam of light, he springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns, but lingers and gazes till full on his sight a second lamp in the belfry burns. A hurry of hoofs in a village street, a shape in the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath from the pebbles in passing a spark struck out by a steed flying fearless and fleet. That was all, and yet through the gloom and the light the fate of a nation was riding that night, and the spark struck out by that steed in his flight kindled the land into flame with its heat. He has left the village, and mounted the steep, and beneath him, tranquil and broad and deep, is the mystic meeting the ocean tides, and under the alders that skirt its edge, now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of a steed as he rides. 
It was twelve by the village clock, when he crossed the bridge into Medford Town. He heard the crowing of the cock, and the barking of the farmer's dog, and felt the damp of the river fog that rises after the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock, when he galloped into Lexington. He saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed, and the meeting-house windows black and bare gaze at him with a spectral glare, as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. It was two by the village clock, when he came to the bridge in Concord town. He heard the bleeding of the flock, and the twitter of birds among the trees, and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadow brown. And one was safe and asleep in his bed, who at the bridge would be first to fall, who that day would be lying dead, pierced by a British musket-ball. You know the rest. In the books you have read, how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them ball for ball, from behind each fence and farmyard wall, chasing the redcoats down the lane, then crossing the fields to emerge again under the trees at the turn of the road, and only pausing to fire and load. So through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that would echo for evermore. For, born on the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed, and the midnight message of Paul Revere. End of poem. The Pied Piper of Hamlin, A Child Story, written for and inscribed to W. M. the Younger, written by Robert Browning, read for LibriVox.org by Stephen Collins. Hamlin towns in Brunswick, by famous Hanover City, the river Weiser, deep and wide, washes its walls on either side, a pleasanter spot you never spied, but, when begins my ditty, almost five hundred years ago, to see the town folks suffer so, from vermin, was a pity. Rats. They fought the dogs and killed the cats, and bit the babies in the cradles, and ate the cheese out of the vats, and licked the soups from the cook's own ladles, split open the kegs of salted sprats, made nests inside men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the woman's chats by drowning their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats. At last the people in a body to the town hall came flocking. "'Tis clear,' they cried, "'our mares are naughty. As for our corporation, shocking, to think we buy gowns lined with ermine, for adults that can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope, because you're old and obese, to find in a furry civic robe ease. Rouse up, sirs, give your brains a racking, to find the remedy we're lacking, or, sure as fate, we'll send you packing. At this the mayor and corporation quacked with a mighty consternation. An hour they sat in council, at length the mayor broke silence. For a gilder I'd my ermine gown sell, I wish I wore a mile hence. It's easy to bid one's rack one's brain, I'm sure my poor head aches again, I've scratched it so, and all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap, a trap! Just as he said this, what should hap? At the chamber door but a gentle tap. Bless us, cried the mayor, what's that? With the corporation as he sat, looking little, though wondrous fat, nor brighter with his eye, nor moister, than a too long opened oyster, save when at noon his paunch grew muttonous, for a plate of turtle, green and gluttonous. Only a scraping of shoes on the mat, anything like the sound of a rat, makes my heart go pit-a-pat. Come in, the mayor cried, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest figure. His queer long coat from heel to head was half of yellow and half of red, and he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin, with light loose hair, yet swarthy skin, no tuft on cheek nor beard on chin, but lips where smiles went out and in. There was no guessing his kith or kin, and nobody could enough admire the tall man in his quaint attire. Quoth one, it's my great-grandsire. 
Starting up at the trump of doom's tone, he had walked his way from his painted tombstone. He advanced to the council table, and, please your honors, he said, I am able, by means of a secret charm, to draw all creatures living beneath the sun, that creep or swim or fly or run, after me so as you never saw, and I chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm, the mow and the toad and the newt and the viper, and people call me the Pied Piper. And here they noticed round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe, to match with his coat of self-same check, and at the scarf's end hung a pipe. And his fingers they noticed were ever strain, as if impatient to be plain. Upon this pipe, as low as it dangled, over his vesture so old-fangled. Yet, he said, poor piper as I am, in Tartary I freed the cham, last June from his huge swarm of gnats, I ease in Asia the Nizam, of a monstrous brood of viper bats. And as for what your brain bewilders, if I can rid your town of rats, will you give me a thousand guilders? One, fifty thousand, was the exclamation of the astonished mayor and corporation. Into the street the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while. Then, like a musical adept, to blow the pipe his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. And ere three shrill notes the pipe uttered, you heard as if an army muttered, and the muttering grew into a grumble, and the grumbling grew into a mighty rumble, and out of the house the rats came tumbling, great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, grave old plotters, gay young friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and prickling whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, followed the piper for their lives. From street to street he piped advancing, and step for step they followed dancing, until they came to the river Viser, wherein all plunged and perished, save one who, stout as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry, as he, the manuscript he cherished, to Ratlin home his commentary, which was, At the first shrill note of the pipe, I heard a sound of a scraping tripe, and putting apples wondrous ripe into cider presses grip, and a moving away of pickled tub boards, and a leaving a jar of conserved cupboards, and a drawing of the corks of a trained oil flask, and a breaking the hoops of buttered cask, and it seems as if a voice, sweeter far than by harp or by psaltery, is breathed, called out, O oh, rats, rejoice! The world is grown to one vast dye psaltery. So munch on, crunch on, take your nuncheon, breakfast, supper, dinner, luncheon, and just as bulky, sugared puncheon, already staved, like a great sun shone, glorious scarce an inch before me. Just as me thought it said, Come, bore me, I found my visor rolling o'er me. You should have heard the Hamlin people, ringing the bells, they rock the steeple. Go, cried the mayor, and get long poles, poke out the nests and block up the holes, consult with carpenters and builders, and leave in our town not even a trace of the rats, when suddenly, up the face, of the piper perked in a marketplace, with a, first, if you please, my thousand guilders. A thousand guilders, the mayor looked blue, so did the corporation, too, for council dinners were rare habit, with clarinet, Mussel, vinde grave, hawk, the half the money would replenish their seller's biggest butt with rhenish, to pay this sum to a wandering fellow with a gypsy coat of red and yellow. Beside, quoth the mayor with a knowing wink, our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with our eyes the vermin sink, and what's dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we're not the folks to shrink from the duty of giving you something for drink and a matter of money to put in your poke. But as for the guilders, what we spoke of them, as you very well know, was a joke. Besides, our losses have made us thrifty. A thousand guilders, come, take fifty. The piper's face fell, and he cried, No trifling, I can't wait. Beside, I've promised to visit by dinner time, Baghdad, and accept the prime of a head cook's pottage, all he's rich in, for having left in the Calfet's kitchen, of a nest of scorpions, no survivor, with him I prove no bargain driver, with you don't think I'll bait a striver, and folks who put me in a passion may find me pipe after a different fashion. How, cried the mayor, do you think I brook, being worse treated than a cook, insulted by a lazy ribald, 
with idle pipe and vest your piebald. You threaten us, fellow, do your worst. Blow your pipe till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe a smooth straight cane, and there he blew three notes, such sweet, soft notes as any musician's cunning, never gave the enraptured air. There was a rustling that seemed like a bustling, of merry crowds justling at pitching and hustling. Small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping and little tongues chattering. And, like fowls in a farmyard, when barley is scattering, out came the children running, all the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flaxen curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping, ran merrily after, the wonderful music with shouting and laughter. The mare was dumb, and the council stood, as if they were changed to blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry, to the children's merrily skipping by, could only follow with the eye. That joyous crowd at the piper's back, but how the mare was on the rack, and the wretched council bosoms beat, as a piper turned from the high street, to where the visor rolled its waters, ride to the way of their sons and daughters. However, he turned from south to west, and Coppelberg Hill his steps addressed, and after him the children pressed, great was a joy in every breast. He never can cross that mighty top, he's forced to let the piping drop, and we shall see our children stop. When, lo, as they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern were suddenly hollowed, and the piper advanced, and the children followed. And all were in, to the very last, the door in the mountain's side shut fast. Did I say all? No. One was lame, and could not dance the whole of the way, and in after years, if you would blame, his sadness, he was used to say, It's dull in our town since my playmates left. I can't forget that... I'm bereft of all the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me. For he led us, he said, to a joyous land, joining the town, and just at hand, where waters gushed and fruit trees grew, and flowers put forth a fairer hue, and everything was strange and new. The sparrows were brighter than the peacocks here, and their dogs outran our fallow deer, and honeybees had lost their stings, and horses were born with eagles' wings. And just as I became assured my lame foot would be speedily cured, the music stopped, and I stood still, and found myself outside the hill, left alone against my will, to go now limping as before, and never hear of that country more. Alas, alas for Hamlin, there came into many a burgher's pate a text which says that heaven's gate up to the rich at as easy a rate as the needle's eye takes a camel in. The mare sent east, west, north, and south to offer the piper by word of mouth whatever it was men's lot to find him, silver and gold to his heart's content if it only return the way he went and bring the children behind him. But when they saw twas a lost endeavor, the piper and dancers were gone forever. They made a decree that lawyers never should think their records dated duly if, after the day of the month and year, these words did not as well appear. And so long after what happened here on 22nd of July, 1376, and the better in memory to fix the place of the children's last retreat, they call it the Pied Piper Street, where anyone playing on a pipe or tabor was sure for the future to lose his labor, nor suffered they hostelry or tavern to shock with mirth a street so solemn, but opposite the place of a cavern they wrote the story on a column. And on the great church window painted the same to make the world acquainted how their children were stolen away, and there it stands this very day. And I must not omit to say that in Transylvania there's a tribe of alien people who ascribe the outlandish ways and dress of which their neighbors lay such stress to their fathers and mothers have arisen out of some subterraneous prison into which they were trepanned long time ago in a mighty band out of Hamlin town and Brunswick land. But how or why, they don't understand. So, Willie, let me and you be wipers, Of scores out with all men, especially pipers. And, whether they pipe us free from rats or from mice, If we've promised them aught, let us keep our promise. End of poem. The Quality of Mercy by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Heather Barnett The quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. 
It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives, and him that takes. It is mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, for in doth it the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself, and earthly power doth then show likest gods, when mercy seasons justice. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Santa Fe Trail, a humoresque, by Rachel Lindsay, read for LibriVox.org by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. I asked the old negro, "What is that bird that sings so well?" He answered, "That is the Rachel Jane." Hasn't it another name, lark or thrush or the like? No, just Rachel Jane. Part One, in which a racing auto comes from the east. This is the order of the music of the morning. First from the far east comes but a crooning. The crooning turns to a sunrise singing. Hark to the calm horn, palm horn, psalm horn. Hark to the faint horn, quaint horn, saint horn. Hark to the pace horn, chase horn, race horn. The holy veil of the dawn is gone. Swiftly the brazen car comes on. It burns in the east as the sunrise burns. I see great flashes where the far trail turns. Its eyes are lamps like the eyes of dragons. It drinks gasoline from big red flagons. Butting through the delicate mists of the morning, it comes like lightning, goes past roaring. It will hail all the windmills, taunting, ringing. Dodge the cyclones, count the milestones, and through the ranges the prairie dog tills, scooting past the cattle on thousand hills. Ho、oh, for the tear horn, scare horn, dare horn! Ho、oh, for the gay horn, bark horn, bay horn! Ho、oh, for Kansas, land that restores us when houses choke us and great books bore us! Sunrise, Kansas, harvesters, Kansas! A million men have found you before us. Part two, in which many autos passed westward. I want live things and their pride to remain. I will not kill one grasshopper vain, though he eats a hole in my shirt like a door. I let him out, give him one chance more. Perhaps while he gnaws my hat in his whim, grasshopper lyrics occur to him. I am a tramp by the long trail's border, given to squalor, rags, and disorder. I nap. And amble and yawn and look, write fool thoughts in my grubby book, recite to the children, explore at my ease, work when I work, beg when I please, give crank drawings that make folks stare to the half-grown boys in the sunset glare, and get me a place to sleep in the hay at the end of a live and let live day. I find in the stubble of the new-cut weeds a whisper and a feasting all one needs. The whisper of the strawberries, white and red, here where the new-cut weeds lie dead. But I would not walk all alone till I die without some life-drunk horns going by. Up round this apple earth they come, blasting the whispers of the morning dumb. Cars in a plain, realistic row, and fair dreams fade when the raw horns blow. On each snapping pennant, a big black name, the careering city whence each car came. They tour from Memphis, Atlanta, Savannah, Tallahassee, and Texarkana. They tour from St. Louis, Columbus, Manistee. They tour from Peoria, Davenport. Kankakee, cars from Concord, Niagara, Boston, cars from Topeka, Emporia, and Austin, cars from Chicago, Hannibal, Cairo, cars from Alton, Oswego, Toledo, 
cars from Buffalo, Kokomo, Delphi, cars from Lodi, Carmi, Lomai, ho oh, for Kansas, land that restores us, when houses choke us and great books bore us, while I look at the high road and look at the sky, while I watch the clouds in amazing grandeur, roll their legions without rain over the blistering Kansas plain, while I sit by the milestone and watch the sky, the United States goes by. Listen to the iron horns ripping, racking. Listen to the quack horns slacking, clacking. Way down the road, trilling like a toad. Here comes the dice horn, here comes the vice horn, here comes the snarl horn, brawl horn, lewd horn, followed by the prude horn, bleak and squeaking. Some of them from Kansas, some of them from Kansas. Here comes the hod horn, plod horn, sod horn, never more to roam horn, loam horn, home horn. Some of them from Kansas, some of them from Kansas. Far away the Rachel Jane, not defeated by the horns, sings amid a hedge of thorns. Love and life, eternal youth, sweet, 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 do and glory, love and truth, sweet, 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 sweet. While smoke-black freights on the double-track railroad, driven as though by the foul fiend's ox goad, screaming to the west coast, screaming to the east, carry off of harvest, bring back a feast, harvesting machinery and harvest for the beast, the hang-cars whiz and rattle on the rails, the sunlight flashes on the tin dinner pails. And then in an instant, ye modern men, behold the procession once again. Listen to the iron horns ripping, racking. Listen to the wise horn, desperate to advise horn. Listen to the fast horn, kill horn, blast horn. Far away the Rachel Jane, not defeated by the horns, sings amid a hedge of thorns. Love and life, eternal youth, sweet, 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 sweet. Do and glory, love and truth, sweet, 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 sweet. The mufflers open on a score of cars with wonderful thunder. Crack, 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 crack. Listen to the gold horn, old horn, cold horn, and all of the tunes till the night comes down on haystack and anthill and wind-bitten town. Then far in the west, as in the beginning, dim in the distance, sweet in retreating, hark to the faint horn, quaint horn, saint horn, hark to the calm horn, Palm horn, psalm horn. They are hunting the goals that they understand, San Francisco and the brown sea sand. My goal is the mystery the beggars win. I am caught in the web the night winds spin. The edge of the wheat ridge speaks to me. I talk with the leaves of the mulberry tree. And now I hear as I sit all alone, in the dusk, by another big Santa Fe stone, the souls of the tall corn gathering round, and the gay little souls of the grass in the ground. Listen to the tale the cottonwood tells. Listen to the windmills singing o'er the wells. Listen to the whistling flutes, without price, of myriad prophets out of paradise. Hearken to the wonder that the night air carries. Listen to the whisper of the prairie fairies singing o'er the fairy plain. Sweet, 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 Love and glory, stars and rain, sweet, sweet, 
sweet, sweet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet twenty nine by William Shakespeare. Read for LibriVox.org by Tina. When in disgrace, with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope. With what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, haply I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings That then I scorn to change my state with kings End of poem This recording is in the public domain Spring Cowardice by Leonora Spire Read for LibriVox.org By Nicole Doolan On the web at NicoleDoolan.com I am afraid to go into the woods. I fear the trees and their mad green moods. I fear the breezes that pull at my sleeves, the creeping arbutus beneath the leaves, and the brook that mocks me with wild, wet words. I stumble and fall at the voice of birds. Think of the terror of those swift showers Think of the meadows of fierce-eyed flowers, And the little things with sudden wings That buzz about me and dash and dart, And the lilac waiting to break my heart. Winter, hide me in your kind snow. I am a coward, a coward, I know. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is Jan McLaughlin recording Sarah Teasdale's poem Spring Night for LibriVox at LibriVox.org Spring Night The park is filled with night and fog. The veils are drawn about the world. The drowsy lights along the paths are dim and pearled. Golden gleaming the empty streets, Gold and gleaming the misty lake. The mirrored lights like sunken swords Glimmer and shake. Oh, is it not enough to be here With this beauty over me? My throat should ache with praise, And I should kneel in joy beneath the sky. O oh, beauty, are you not enough? Why am I crying after love, With youth, a singing voice, and eyes To take earth's wonder with surprise? Why have I put off my pride? Why am I unsatisfied? I, for whom the pensive night Binds her cloudy hair with light, I, for whom all beauty burns like incense in a million urns. Oh, beauty, are you not enough? Why am I crying after love? End of poem.
Time to Die by Ray G. Dandridge. Read for LibriVox.org by Fox and the Stars of ShiningHalf.com. Black Brother, think you life so sweet that you would live at any price? Does mere existence balance with the weight of your great sacrifice? Or can it be you fear the grave enough to live and die a slave? O oh, brother, be it better said, when you are gone and tears are shed, that your death was the stepping stone your children's children crossed upon. Men have died that men might live. Look every foeman in the eye. If necessary, your life give for something, ere in vain you die. Recorded May 1st, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. To a Traveler by Lionel Johnson Recorded for LibriVox.org by Robert Garrison And dedicated to the memory of Larry Ingalls The mountains and the lonely death at last Upon the lonely mountains, O oh strong friend the wandering over and the labor past. Thou art indeed at rest. Earth gave thee of her best, that labor and this end. Earth was thy mother and her true son thou. Earth called thee to a knowledge of her ways. Upon the great hills, up the great streams now, upon earth's kindly breast, Thou art indeed at rest, Thou and thine arduous days. Fare thee well, O strong heart, The tranquil night looks calmly on thee, And the sun pours down His glory over thee, O heart of might. Earth gives thee perfect rest, Earth whom thy swift feet pressed. Earth, whom the vast stars crown. End of poem. The Young Dead by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox.org by Nicole Doolin. On the web at NicoleDoolin.com. Ah, how I pity the young dead who gave all that they were and might become that we with tired eye should watch this perfect sea reweave its patterning of silver wave round scented cliffs of our beauteous and bay. No more shall any rose along the way, the myrtled way that wanders to the shore, nor jonquil twinkling meadow any more, nor the warm lavender that takes the spray smell only of sea salt and the sun. But... Through recurring seasons, every one shall speak to us with lips that darkness closes, shall look at us with eyes that miss the roses, clutch us with hands whose work was just begun, laid idle now beneath the earth we tread, and always we shall walk with the young dead. Ah, how I pity the young dead, whose eyes strain to the sod to see these perfect skies, who feel the new wheat springing in their stead, and the lark singing for them overhead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.